Good morning. Um, I have to say one comment before I get started, and that is I uh, started at NIEHS as a student when I was uh, 20 years old and uh, have been there ever since. Never dreamed that I'd be sitting at a table with these individuals because they are absolutely my, my heroes and pioneers in environmental health. So if I sound a little bit giddy, you'll understand why. Cause it's, it's, a, it's a thrill for me. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, I think we all agree it's been an incredibly information rich day and a morning. So I'm going to try to take us all the way back to yesterday morning, as long ago as that was, and just kind of remind us of uh, why we came together to begin with and what our charge was. Um, Lynn started us off with our overall charge for the meeting, which I think we've certainly fulfilled. Briefly, our goals were to examine approaches to identifying and reducing potential environmental public health risks uh, to new and existing industrial chemicals. Successes in areas for improvement in current regulatory programs for assessing chemical safety. Frameworks for chemical prioritization to inform testing and risk management strategies. And sustainability and green chemistry approaches to the design and use of safer alternatives and reduction of risk of chemicals in our society. Uh, Lynn pointed out the difficulty of determining exactly how many chemicals are in use in the U.S. and in what ways, and this is a fact many others return to later in the discussions of the, but the challenges, the impediments, and I'll say the opportunities for chemical regulation and risk assessment. Um, lastly, Lynn provided a snapshot of the current landscape in terms of how many chemicals have been tested and managed and by whom. Uh, following Lynn, um, Dr. Halperin then led us through five current paradigms of public health in relation to chemical assessments, including industrial hygiene, cascade of prevention, surveillance, embeddedness, and dose response conundrum. Uh, he illustrated many of these through the example of otoluidine, if I got that right. Uh, and he introduced to the discussion the concept of a sentinel health event, uh, which prompted much discussion later on. Uh, lastly, he posited that perhaps the best public health approach uh, might be a paradigm that re-examines the dose response curve of exposures and the risk of disease um, that presumes the highest risk at the highest exposure. And he illustrated through a comparison to blood pressure risk that the greatest areas of chemical effects may actually be closer to the middle of the dose response curve. And he suggested that a better approach may be to shift this curve to the left in terms of our assessment and management efforts so that we not only take care of people at the highest exposures, but also, in fact, take care of the rest of us as well. Um, lastly, on that panel, Dr. Witherspoon took us through an important effort, the National Conversation on Public Health and Chemical Exposures, which is a joint government and stakeholder effort to ensure that chemicals are used and managed in ways that protect the safe, safe and healthy uh, individuals. This effort resulted in an action agenda, some of the, of the goals of which are to prevent harmful exposures, better scientific understanding and monitoring, uh, and a particular emphasis on health and environmentally burdened communities. She mentioned specific examples of how the recommendations of this action agenda are being taken, including changes in ATSDR to be more focused on community concerns, and an effort to look at options for expanding the reach of NCEH's biomonitoring efforts. Some of the partners uh, who are continuing to push for implementation of the action agenda include APHA and APHL, and Dr. Witherspoon invited all of us to become more engaged with this effort. Um, so I uh, only wanted to focus briefly on the, the um, presentations. I believe these will be posted and you'll have access to these following the meeting. Uh, but the, the heart of the issue was the, follow the discussion following. Um, we started that with a, a number of questions and issues raised surrounding uh, community exposures and community concerns. And Dr. Claudio raised the issue of the need to institutionalize the public's voice again in chemical risk evaluation and protection efforts, um, such as through the past NIH Council of Public Representatives and similar efforts. Um, and uh, this point was reiterated by Dr. Witherspoon um, that there's concern that these bodies are uh, being uh, degenerated and dismantled for a variety of reasons, um, that they need to be reconstituted or re-energized, um, as they are a great tool for engagement and for coalescing the public uh, and both federal and non-federal partners around these issues. A question was raised regarding her mention of ATSDR's increased focus on community concerns as to whether the specific concerns of specific communities would be made publicly available. Um, and she responded that many of these 
um, many of the in organizations involved in the national conversation are indeed hoping for and encouraging that level of transparency from ATSDR and NCEH and from the, the communities and the governing bodies involved in, in gathering that information. Um, Dr. Anderson asked the panel if they saw evidence of a resurgence of traditional community concern types of issues, such as waste sites and food safety issues. Um, and he maintained that the threshold concept of exposure may not be sufficient to protect public health. And inquired about any test, uh, any new tests that really point to the need to decrease exposures related, for example, to subtle effects such as endocrine disruption. Um, Lynn took the response on this one that the resource base for addressing community issues has become, um, and I thought this was an excellent quote, tattered at every governmental level. I think that's a, an apt description. Um, but she uh, did note that social media and related technologies are allowing for a lot of new ways for people to connect and network and become empowered outside the traditional structures. Um, she cautioned that uh, although there's a lot of benefit to these means, uh, the potential downside is that they do enable the transmission of inaccurate information um, among communities and that as uh, public health officials and researchers, we need to be sure to address uh, these hypotheses that are incorrect when they make it out into the communities, that that's part of our role. Um, she also added that the emergence of these new technologies over time will enable, enable us to have a uh, better understanding of low-level exposures and predict their effects. There's a lot of fundamental research being done at a molecular level and in vitro to help us understand what is exactly going on with chemicals. But um, as she put it, we can't connect the dots yet. There's still plenty left to do. Um, she uh, lastly cautioned that one outcome is that communities are hearing about this information but don't know what to do with it. So uh, that's my personal interest is in research translation, which is to help inform decision making. And I think that's um, absolutely critical uh, that we bridge the gap from just putting the information out there and assuming people will know what to do with it to really showing people how to apply the information to their decision making processes. Um, there was a very lively discussion, I will say, of the use of sentinel events, and I'm not going to weigh in on that. I'm just going to convey what I heard or thought I heard um, as initiators or requirements for focusing attention to chemical exposures. Dr. Sanders made the argument that issues in communities with exposures are not, quote, sentinel exposures, and perhaps this concept is not applicable or appropriate in these situations. Um, he posited that, oops, sorry technical issues, that sentinel events are not just a single exposure event, but can be ongoing exposure that suggests a failure of prevention. Uh, the challenge, he said, is to distinguish background exposures using existing surveillance infrastructures that are uh, fairly strong from outlier events of high exposures that indicate something unusual is going on. And from this standpoint, he said that there should be actually more emphasis on sentinel events uh, and not less, and that such information should be more transparent and readily available to the public. Um, Dr. Goldman added that while occupational exposures are well controlled, although uh, some took issue with that. What we don't know is what's happening in more general settings where exposures are highly dispersed or in intermediate situations such as smaller industries. Um, and uh, Dr. McGartland raised the topic of the relevance of new resources of metadata, metadata and meta-analysis in risk assessment. Um, and uh, Dr. Goldman discussed exciting new efforts such as by the National Toxicology Program to look at systematic review. Um, and some of the changes to EPA's IRIS program. Um, the question was raised about the impact of changes in chemical risk assessment on healthcare systems and cost by Dr. Bajani. Um, if, as a reminder, Dr. Goldman presented the Landrigan figure of $76.6 billion per year in medical costs attributable to known chemical hazards, but uh, there's some question about the accuracy of this figure. Um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Solomon returned to the example of o toluidine to raise the issue of data gaps and problems uh, concerning the byproducts of chemical breakdown that are also of concern, but typically unregulated in the United States. And she stated that often we can identify a priority chemical, but we have no way of finding out if it's still being used, where and what products, and how people might be exposed. And I will make one last statement. Um, 
which uh, Lynn gave, and she said uh, it's important to have support for EPA on requiring companies to electronically report that this is considered by industry to be a burden, but we have to flip this assumption to show that this is actually uh, information that's extremely beneficial both, both to them and to society.